A pretty tense and heated tone today in the House of Commons as a liberal seized on Pierre Polyev's controversial stop at a protest camp last week, calling on the conservative leader to denounce white supremacist and misogynistic groups. Polyev had a rebuttal, and here's how that unfolded in question period. Last week, we saw the leader of the opposition once again visit with supporters of white supremacy, anarchy, and misogyny. This has been a regular occurrence. I ask him to clearly disavow the views of these dangerous people. Will he do that? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I unequivocally disavow the guy who spent the first half of his adult life as a practicing racist dressing up in blackface. Okay, it was that kind of day in the House of Commons. We're going to talk about this and a bunch of the other issues that were discussed uh, today with the Power Panel. Lisa Raitt is a former Conservative Cabinet Minister. Brad Levine is a former Communications Director for the NDP. And here with me in the studio, Vandana Cotter is a former advisor to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And Rob Russo is a former CBC Parliamentary uh, Bureau Chief. Rob, I'll start with you. Uh, the question Pierre Polyev asked was about the decriminalization decision happening, unfolding in British Columbia. The response from the government House Leader was clearly scripted and planned to raise this issue, and you saw how he replied. What do we make of what we saw happen today? Um, I'm not sure, uh, and I'm not sure it was particularly edifying from both sides. Um, look, he has already condemned this group. I think he's called them odious losers. Uh, these, this is the Diagalon people, has he not? Uh, for, for suggesting that uh, they might be interested in assaulting mm -hmm. his wife. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, has, he, uh, has he played footsie with uh, people who wanted to shut down the street in front of the Supreme Court of Canada and shut down Parliament? Uh, yes, he has done that. Um, but to suggest that he's in favor of white supremacists and, and the people who wanted to assault his wife, I, I think might be a bridge too far. I've always said uh, politics is about addition and, and not subtraction. Um, I, I'm not sure where the addition is for Mr. Poiliev in meeting with the groups that he met with in New Brunswick, apart from those who might be part of Diagonal, Maybe he's done the calculus and he's decided that uh, those who are interested in a tax revolt might be better for him. But I I I'm not sure that this is a winning strategy uh, for the Liberals, and I'm not sure that his, uh, his response was necessarily edifying either. Brad, uh, what did you make of this as a moment in, in Parliament? I mean, this is clearly an issue the Liberals want to raise, as you can tell from their social media feeds. And mm -hmm. you saw that response there from uh, Mr. Polyev, that if they're going to come at him with this, he's going to come right back with that. Yeah. Yeah, well, just think, David, we only have another 12 or 18 months uh, of this tone in, in, the, in Parliament. Um, it's it's going to be a long, you know, the, the phony war uh, leading up to the next uh, federal election. There's no question about it. Um, you know, did Paulie have make a mistake by stopping and, and meeting with this group? I, I think he certainly handed uh, his opponents uh, something uh, to club him with. In the absence of that, uh, who knows what the what uh, the Liberals would have had uh, today uh, to go out on uh, against Polyev. And of course, you know, Trudeau's given the gift that keeps on giving, which is which is the blackface. And then, of course, uh, messing up the response to where he can't remember how many times he dressed up in blackface. So uh, the question is: Is there any? A new room for undecideds to uh, be convinced one way or another. I think these are both well-worn. I think blackface has run its course. I don't know if too many folks who are leaning liberal now all of a sudden now hear blackface and will retreat on that. But, you know, the, 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 the challenge that, um, that Paul Yev has, as a front-runner, as a lead in the polls, and not just the stop in Atlantic Canada with this group, but also with the Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist out of the States, you know, pretty much coming out and endorsing uh, Pierre Polyev. You know, how close can he get to that to that radical fringe without losing uh, the mainstream that 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 you need in order to win a majority in the House of Commons? And of course, uh, you know, how, to to Rob's point, how many people do you attract by stopping versus just mm. keep going and not offering your opponents any opportunity to come back and punch you in the nose next time the House sits? You know, Lisa, you, you know, you, there's obviously, we get accused of hand-wringing too much of a tone on these shows when you talk about how things are going in the House of Commons, but this was clearly something the Liberals had teed up ready to go today. And just tactically, uh, I feel like you should have anticipated that was going to come back, because he has used, Mr. Polyev has, that line of defense uh, in the past before. I just wonder, where do you think this is going? I mean, th th there's a pretty heated argument going on there about the decriminalization uh, issue w with drugs in, in British Columbia. And, and this mm -hmm. is uh, where the conversation goes in the parliament. 
issues are important. I find this terribly boring that we're discussing this yet again, quite frankly. Um, to re for reality check, uh, people aren't paying attention when this stuff happens yeah. at all. And even if they are, people who like Trudeau or Polyev are going to still like them, and people who don't like Trudeau or Polyev are still going to not like them. This doesn't move the needle. It, all it does, I think, is to make them both look like that they'd rather sling mud than they would work on the issues of Canadians. I don't think it helps. Vandana, how do you see it? Um, maybe people aren't paying attention to the House of Commons, but now there's a beautiful little media clip that the Liberals can use to push out. And they can just push that out and that clip that piece saying that Pierre Polyev has refused to denounce this group. And I think what it does is it sets up the Liberals to say that what kind of prime minister do you want? And kind of keep that contrast to the PM and show that he's not ready. So what the prime minister did, he did something a long time ago when he was much younger where he didn't understand the repercussions of what he was doing. Right? He doesn't understand what the hurt that that would create, and he's apologized for that. Pierre Polyev met with someone, a far-right group, uh, last week, and knows the repercussions of that and how hurt people would be from that, and still refuses to apologize for it, and instead deflects an answer and just points to something that happened a long time ago that the PM has already responded to. And I think what it says, if you want the big job and you represent, want to represent Canadians across the country, then actions speak louder than words, and you should be able to denounce white supremacy full stop. That should be very easy. And then if he said that, that cuts that argument. But instead, now the Liberals can use this over and over again on a clip, on an ad, on social media, and say, Pierre Polyev refused to denounce it. And maybe he doesn't convince everybody. But starts picking at this sense that maybe you don't want this guy to be the next guy. Okay, uh, Lisa, I want to move out this, and I actually I want to talk about uh, one of the other issues that was talked about there, but I did want to get everybody's round of that because of what we saw there today. Uh, the issue yeah. of foreign workers uh, at these auto uh, deals, uh, as part of the auto deals mm -hmm. that we're seeing. The Conservatives want the government to make contracts with companies like Stellantis, uh, Volkswagen. They want them public uh, after a union said foreign workers could fill positions that could go to Canadians. Here's how the Prime Minister responded to this today. We need to make sure there are as many Canadian workers as possible, if not uh, almost all Canadian workers doing the construction and maintenance and, and installation. I will highlight, though, that it is something that the Conservatives seem to have latched onto to try and distract from the fact that they actually don't support the Stellantis investment. Okay, uh, the Prime Minister, Lisa, obviously they're making a very political yeah. argument, but, but on the math, yeah. here's the question I have, because he's at the CBTU, the Canada Building Trades Union meeting, and they have been mm -hmm. the union raising the alarm about what's happening with the Stellantis plant. There are 2,000 people working on that project. 72 of those jobs are foreign workers. 1,600 mm -hmm. of those jobs are members of that union. Is this a big deal that a small number of foreign workers on a workforce that large are there when the company says they need them for specific time-limited tasks? What, what's your view of it? It could be. I mean, it depends on whether or not that's going to be a number that grows. You know, when the United States were, were putting in place the way that they were going to be coming out of the Great Recession, one of the things that they did do with respect to labor was they made it very, very clear that the United States labor was going to be essential. In fact, they do that a lot. They, they make sure that they take care of their own. And there's nothing to say that the prime minister couldn't have done exactly the same thing in these kinds of contracts. And he didn't. And I think that may be a better way of approaching approaching it than the, than the numbers game. But, you know, it is very effective and impactful for people to say, well, these jobs are just going to go to people who are coming over to build instead. And it does seem to be uh, a meme that is out there and that is believed. Your numbers are interesting, David. I haven't heard it put that way before. Obviously, 72 isn't a big number, but it seems like it's a bigger issue than what it is, I suppose. Yeah, Rob, it's less than 4% of the workforce there, and 1,600 of them are, are in the union. That is uh, the most upset about this. I was speaking with uh, some people in the union movement today, and they feel this is maybe overblown. I don't know. I, I mean, I've seen in the oil industry back home that people came in to get it going and then went away once it was going, and locals filled the jobs. That's the argument here. Yeah, and I think if you look at the cross-partisan nature of uh, support for this investment with conservatives in Ontario and liberals in uh, in Ottawa supporting this, it, it kind of mutes the argument. I also find that the criticism of the deals by Conservatives have been muted. They're going after this, but they haven't gone after very loudly uh, the investment. I think the most effective argument against the investment has come from a Liberal. It's come from Mark Carney, uh, <laughs> who, who yeah. believes that, that uh, the, the money might have been best invested on a less risky investment that has an impact on Canadians right in their own homes, Get heat pumps for people where they can work. You do that, you're going to spend a lot 
less than 40 or 50 billion dollars you're going to bring home climate change the benefits of preparing for climate change to them uh, i thought that was a more effective criticism than the criticism of of whether or not we should bring in a couple of people to show us how to use the machinery that we don't know how to use i'm i'm thinking about buying a chainsaw I, if somebody wants to come along from home hardware and show me how to use a chainsaw so I don't remove my kneecaps, I'm going to be in favor of that. Yeah, okay. Just to pick up on what you said about Mr. Kearney, and look, he knows way more about money than I will ever know about right. money. Uh, and I appreciate his argument that, you know, the retail politics of giving people heat pumps for the buy-in. But future-proofing your most important manufacturing industry has a value to the country, does it not? I, I mean, you know, otherwise a lot of money is going to go to a lot of other places that aren't Ontario. You're making a very large bet on something that might happen 10 years from now. Uh, it's it's a speculative bet. Um, I, I think that's where, uh, just based on what I've seen, uh, I think we're going to a net zero auto industry uh, over the next 25 years. Um, but is it going to be this technology? We don't know. Is the IRA still going to be there in a year? We don't know. And if you don't have the IRA, are you going to have to fork over these these uh, No, subsidies. it's in the contract. That's if right. the IRA goes away, and the subsidies go So then go what, happens, what happens to, to, to mm. the, uh, the corporate side of, of, that, of that equation? Are they going to stick with this as well if right. that goes away? Lots of unanswered questions. It's a big, huge bet. Maybe they win big, mm. uh, but they won't be around, I don't think, when, when the bet comes in one way or another. Brad, uh, on the foreign workers angle, uh, I know Jagmeet Singh says he's concerned about this and says uh, he wants to make sure there's good union-paying jobs. Honda isn't unionized, so I'm not sure how it fits into necessarily that particular um, uh, arrangement. But uh, do you think there's a political vulnerability here, or is this, you know, a, a union playing to some of its memberships uh, on this? Well, I think it might have to do a little bit with, with communication as well, and also how the the, the parent company who's undertaking the initiative, how they deal with, with workers. Um, you've got, uh, you know, large majority of workers uh, in the Stellantis LG plant uh, are Canadian. Uh, and it, we're talking about building the facility itself. So that's, those are different people than the ones who will actually produce uh, uh, the products, whether it's uh, assembly or, uh, or, or the cars themselves. Now, you take a look at what Honda's doing. Honda is actually sitting down with the with the Canadian uh, building trades unions and 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 seeking uh, to come up with a uh, memorandum of understanding as to who's going to build what, who's going to be trained on what, and bringing in that, that expertise. And you can see the officials from Honda talking about how once we talk about labor shortages, once we talk about training, uh, that they'll satisfy some of these criticisms that the union is is flagging. And it's early stages in the Honda uh, uh, initiative versus the, the Stellantis one, which is a kind of LG, you know, is obviously mm -hmm. overseas, but Stellantis is, is Chrysler, uh, North American. So I, I think it actually has to do with that. I think if you sit down with the with with the unions and you talk about uh, what's going to be happening, who's coming in, you break down some of that those communication challenges. I'm not saying it's all communication problems, but I'd much rather have the union sitting down with Honda, even though Honda's assembly is is non-unionized, but the building of the facility right. will be. These yeah. these are the people, the electricians, uh, the iron workers, uh, Layuna, all all of these folks who are going to be building the plants themselves. Um, much better way of going about it, in my opinion. So I think that, that, that there might be some broken telephone, and it also might have to do with how the parent employer deals with, uh, with workers in general. Yeah, but Brad, just on that, I mean, I, I, I come back to the math. Uh, you know, if, if someone came in and said, we're going to create 2,000 construction jobs, yeah. and 96.4% of them will be Canadian unionized jobs, and we need 3%, 3.5% of the workforce to come in to deal with technical specifications that, that we need for this phase of the project. Yeah. Is this a drag them in front of the parliamentary committee level of, 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 of issue? I, yeah. I, I, help me understand this. Yeah, well, the claim by the, the Canadian building trades unions on the, on the Stellantis LG plant is that there are, uh, they're making the claim that in the Kent Middlesex area outside of Windsor, that mm. there are uh, qualified individuals who can do some of the jobs that the folks who have been brought in overseas can do. Now, they, they have to make that case, even if it's 50 or 25, whatever, that's the case that they're making. Uh, but that, that's why I'm thinking, as a percentage, it doesn't seem, 96 to 4 doesn't seem uh, too, too lopsided. But the, 
the union's making the case here, the, mm -hmm. the, the alliance of unions is making the case here that there's uh, qualified individuals in the region who can do the job. So they gotta, they gotta press that case and make it. But no, 96 to four is not a, not a bad ratio. Uh, the question is also, and this, this is what happens on some infrastructure projects, whether it's like the, uh, the uh, Canada Line SkyTrain uh, in, in Vancouver for the 2010 Olympics, when you bring in expertise and then they, they have to make sure that they're training folks locally so that they can then carry on the work after it's done versus coming in, right. leaving, and then and then uh, we realize none of that benefit, and then the foreign workers uh, go back home. So I think the CBTU is, it has to press its case uh, with the Windsor uh, area plants that they do have the talent here uh, in order to uh, in order to build uh, these facilities. Vandana, where do you see this? The prime minister <laughs> met with them today to try to reassure them, as did the labor minister Randy Blossom was there as well. I, I mean, what do you make of it all? I think this was an attempt at a political hit by the opposition. I think that's simply that. Like when I read Rick Perkins, I think the statement, you know, I took a while to be like, what, what happened? What is this? But it really was just like an attempt to like to poke holes at something. I think what happened is that the government had to win that day. You know, they have a big project that's going to produce long-term sustainable jobs that is going to reinvest in the auto industry and, and invigorate them. And I think it's not only just for the federal liberal government, but for the, for the provincial conservative government. And I think Doug Ford thinks it's good for Canada and for growth. And I think what the opposition is trying to do is try to pick something that will be easy for the broader public to pick up. So you can just see on social media in a 30 second clip or something that we're protecting you from foreign workers. Now, personally, I hate the term foreign worker, I know that's mm -hmm. the term, but I hate it. But it just adds a lot of other connotations there. But I think that was their attempt. And I think they're trying to find a way to, I think the government's trying to find their stride here. Mm -hmm. you, know, you see they had a strong you know, opening before the budget. You know, they, and they had this great jobs announcement. So where can they poke holes in something good? They're not gonna say, we don't like the auto sector. They're not gonna say, we don't believe in in, you know EVs but they're gonna say oh but this won't help Canadian jobs and give that inference so that the average person who doesn't have time to really look at the math and pay mm. attention to be like oh did you not hear the government's filling this with foreign workers without understanding fully that that's not actually not what's happening so, so Lisa I mean on this once these things are up and running I mean it's gonna be Canadians in the area working in the plants I mean th those jobs presumably the manufacturing jobs for the long term um, will be Canadian. So, I mean, it, it, I, I just wonder how concerned should people be about this? If it is such a small percentage and, and the permanent manufacturing jobs will be undoubtedly Canadian because of the locations of the plants, how, how big of a concern should this be for people? I mean, I think the bigger concern for people should be whether or not these things actually do get built, quite frankly, because sure. yeah. we're not at the we're not at the final decision on investment. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen between now and then. And we're kind of looking at it like way in the future, what's possibly going to happen. Um, it, it, I don't disagree with Vandana that this is something that the opposition does want to pick at. They want to create this kind of I, I belief that the that the government um, once again has screwed up on a deal and it's not good for Canadians. But it's playing into a, a feeling that a lot of people already have about this government. So that's why it's successful and that's why it's annoying because people do not give this government the benefit of the doubt when it comes to negotiating economic contracts. And as a result, they're constantly having to show their work. And some of the stuff that they're doing, I'm gonna say, it's good. It's really good. It's going to help long-term growth. But the reality is, is that they have to recognize that they're not going to be taken at their word anymore, that this is a good thing, and they got to be prepared to handle all the stakeholders wherever they're coming from. Okay, we want to touch on another issue uh, before we, we, we wrap it up, uh, because pro-Palestinian protests ramped up at McGill University in Montreal over the weekend with students setting up encampments on campus. Today, demonstrators at UBC in Vancouver are doing the same, demanding their schools divest from Israel-related investments. Liberal MPs weighed in on the encampments today. McGill is a place of free discourse. It's one where the right to protest has to be respected. Uh, it doesn't at the same time that right allow violence. Peaceful protest, I think, is everyone's right. And, uh, and at the same time, it's important that everyone feels safe on the campuses. It has nothing to do with whether a peaceful demonstration is allowed or not. An encampment is not allowed. I called on Miguel to work with the Montreal police to do something about it because it's a violation of Miguel policy. 
Okay, Vandana, that's kind of a summary of the liberal conversation <laughs> for the last couple, <laughs> couple of months on this. But look, we've seen what this has done in the United States at the campuses down there. I know this, these are provincial institutions and it's a local policing challenge, but people are going to look to the federal government to say something on this and do something on this. Where do you think this potentially goes now that we're seeing these encampments in Canada? I think you've seen the maximum where it's going to go. I think you're going to see that people are going to say that, listen, you have a right for to peacefully protest. You can share your legitimate view on the war, but if that crosses into hate speech, if it crosses into anti-Semitism, or people are feeling afraid for legitimate reasons, or they're being targeted, then yeah, that's gonna cross a line, and McGill has to do something about that, and has to denounce it. So I don't think they're gonna go any further on this. I think, I think they're gonna keep it to where that is, and then see what happens, and hopefully this stays like a peaceful protest where there isn't hate speech, and that people don't get hurt. You know, Rob, there's a lot of Jewish students uh, concerned about this, nervous about this. Uh, we're, we're hearing that a lawyer is going to take this to court tomorrow to try to get an injunction. We're going to speak with one of the organizers uh, coming up in a little bit on the show. What, do you, what are your thoughts as you see those sorts of images popping up at McGill? Well, <clears throat> a lot of people are comparing these protests to what happened in 1968 uh, when the protests against the, the Vietnam War started. Uh, then, like now, it's a legitimate thing, uh, and in many ways, it's an important thing for students who are learning about democracy to learn that that uh, protest is a legitimate mm -hmm. and sometimes necessary part of, of functioning in a democracy. But in 1968, the students who were protesting against the war in Vietnam, rarely did I hear them say, we need to eliminate the United States, which is the aggressor in this war. And there are a lot of protesters who are involved in, in this um, who are saying, in effect, we need to eliminate the state of Israel in order to solve the Palestinian problem, or they're saying, uh, we support what happened on October 7th. It was a legitimate part of the struggle against the state of Israel. And, and that's where they cross into uh, uh, poten potentially hate speech. Now, you're speaking about the American protests, right? Because I don't that's think right. we've seen anything well, connected to the McGill well, one Mc yet. McGill uh, has yeah. said that it has evidence of mm. people advocating violence uh, uh, right. uh, and and uh, we haven't seen that evidence yet right. and, I, and there and there has been a shift in M McGill stance this morning they said that they were going to ask police to remove those encampments and, and this afternoon they decided not to I think that the decision not to is a wise thing people should be allowed to protest should they be allowed to go further uh, and and call for the elimination of, of, of an entire people from the map no I don't think that they should be and I think that's what everybody is going to be watching to see where that part of the uh, protest goes. Brad, uh, you know, you've led many student protests back in the day yourself uh, on far less controversial issues like tuition fees. I mean, where do you see this going when, when you look at this and, and uh, what we saw in the United States and, and uh, you know, what we've seen in the streets of Canada for, since yeah. October? Well, what I was, what I was fascinated about is how quickly uh, across the United States uh, this spread. Um, and you saw the reports out of McGill today that just over the last, just over the weekend, it's only Monday, but, uh, you know, the encampment there uh, tripled in size. Um, so, you know, it is likely that we'll be here next Monday talking on this panel about, uh, you know, how, how many more campuses. Right now, I think there's, there's a couple at least have, have been reported on. There may be more. There may be, there certainly will be more by, uh, by next Monday. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's it, I think it is completely legitimate for a uh, student population to call on the institution to take certain actions, i.e. to divest. We certainly did that uh, during the apartheid. I'm certainly not comparing what happened in South Africa in the 1980s to what's happening in the Middle East. I'll leave that for the, the discussion. But nonetheless, it was legitimate for students of my our generation to call on the uh, institutions to take certain actions. I think where, um, and I, I, th 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 there may be uh, some support there. I think where, where the potential for losing uh, support for the cause is when it goes beyond that, uh, and to, you know, to the other panelists' point, where we call for the elimination of Israel, uh, or we tolerate um, hatred towards Jews, or to make students. Uh, feel uncomfortable because of their religion, and I know that that's certainly happening in the states. I know at Columbia, students who of uh, who are of, of the from the Jewish community are being told to stay at home, uh, and I don't know if that, in the long term, builds support uh, for your cause uh, mm. or erodes it. And it's certainly you know listening to American news this morning uh, during the morning workout, it it's it's at a fever pitch, and I don't know the the. 
the benefit of, of a fever pitch where n neither sides are listening to each other uh, at all. I don't know how, how we get that further. I think the only thing that's going to de-escalate it here in Canada, and particularly in the States, um, is to see movement on the conversations that you had in, in your early reports, David, about yeah. uh, looking for uh, an end to the hostilities uh, in Gaza. Yeah, Hamas has uh, reportedly left uh, Cairo to come back with a written counterproposal to the Israeli proposal, so who knows where that's going to go. Uh, but Lisa, when, when you see the sort of the campus protest movement coming north, um, not surprising, I, I, I guess, that it's here, but what are your thoughts on where this could potentially go and, and how McGill has responded to it so far? Yeah, well, let's be really clear. You keep saying that it's student protest. My understanding from reports from McGill is that they have proof that it is not all students, that the increase has actually been people coming from off campus who are coming under the student movement, which for all the good reasons we've discussed already is a right for for the ability to protest. But in the B-roll you just showed, David, I saw a sign in there that said something along the lines is resist until free. Well, what does resist harken back to? I think all I'm hearing about on resistance is that October 7 was a form of resistance and it was actually justifiable. So you can't tell me that that sign, resist until free or resistance is, is essential. That to me is sending a very clear signal what we're talking about. That stuff cannot be tolerated. It it is outright anti-Semitism, and it has to be dealt with in the appropriate way. And I know that we're all worried about stepping on on toes and and you know hand wringing on this kind of stuff. But the reality is, is that we have to protect people in society, and that stuff is just not acceptable. Yeah, uh, Vandana, I, I, Lisa has a point that uh, I, I don't know if McGill is saying they're not all students or not all McGill students. Certainly, there's some Concordia students in there, and probably, as as Lisa said, people from the broader community coming in. But we use the signs and some of the language we've seen. I mean, resistance means many things to different people. People saying October 7th was resistance upsets people who point to <clears throat> nonviolent resistance, uh, which speaks to sort of how fraught this whole thing uh, has become, right? Yeah, and I think that's where you're going to see a lot of, like, with the MPs and McGill looking for outright hate speech. And I think they're not going to look for interpretations of things. I think they're going to look for outright hate speech and actions that lead to anti-Semitism or make students feel uh, discomfort. I think they know that McGill has a responsibility to not further make people feel polarized and, and, and drive this issue further. Mm. But I think if students are peacefully protesting and, 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 and just legitimately sharing their views on, on the conflict, that's fine. But just keeping an eye out again on, on what's actually happening. And I think they're going to look for an actual, like, what is actually happening on hate speech? When is their actions on anti-Semitism? And wait for that to actually take an action. Lisa, how do you, because you brought up that particular sign, how do you think they, they need to manage this particular issue at a situation like McGill? We're so far at it seems to just be an encampment, right? It, it doesn't, has, has written it, risen to like high levels of aggression from the reporting that I've seen out of there. Uh, how, do, how do you manage it? Well, I don't, listen, I empathize with people who are trying to manage the situation on a day-to-day -day mm. basis. There's no question about it. But I would say that it should be made extremely clear that the codes of conduct are being reviewed and that students will be held to the code of conduct if that's the case. And anybody who's not a student is trespassing, quite frankly. So, uh, Rob, we've heard there's going to be an injunction sought tomorrow. Um, I, I don't know if they will obey an injunction. I don't know because police would ultimately, I guess, have to enforce an injunction. And maybe this is a way it, the police action is taken without McGill having to be responsible for it. I, I, I'm not clear how this gets resolved. What's your sense? Uh, we don't know. Mm. Uh, and we hope it's done peacefully. Um, and we hope uh, that those who are miscreants are, are, are prosecuted. And if that means you go after people individually, that's fine. You know, I've, I've said in the past here that I thought that the prime minister needed to show more leadership. I thought in the last week he did. I, I thought that he made a very clear statement in the last week in which he said uh, glorifying the October 7th attacks represents an act of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's a very clear standard mm -hmm. that should be applied to these demonstrations across the country. If McGill, as they say, has video evidence of that kind of activity, they should hand it over to the police and the police should do their jobs. Does the prime minister need to give a big speech on this? Like, uh, y y like uh, I, I don't, I truly don't know. Rob, just you first and then Vandita, like, because yeah. uh, clear message on it, but his own caucus is so uh, conflicted with this. The big cities are conflicted with this. I, I mean, what, yeah. what could he do here? I, I've said for a long, long time mm. that we need to be brought together as a people. 
and, and that clear lines need to be spelled out uh, from, from the Prime Minister. I, I, I think that that would be a valuable thing. Yes, it's a dangerous thing, but it's a valuable thing uh, for people at a time when there is growing division. Uh, I, I think we need to hear from our leader. Vandana, what do you think? I uh, mean, it's a tough one. <clears throat> I think the time for that has passed. Yeah. I think, um, I think what he needs to do to bring people together is um, when these things come together to try to bring in the fact that, you know, what brings us together? You know, what do we advance together as Canadians, right? And that is the right to protect one another, to feel protected, you know, how we, and, and, and how, we are, how we live and who we are. But I think the best way to connect with people is actually small groups. And I think um, in his travels, he's meeting the small groups behind closed doors mm -hmm. and really understanding the fears, the real fears, and, and bringing people together. And I understand some of that has been interfaith as well. So I think that is the best way because the problem is the minute he takes a podium and starts talking about it, everyone's going to sparse it differently. Yeah. Um, as you know, this is a conflict that really hits people right here. You know, it's, and it's, it's fraught in like intergenerational trauma and sensitivities where, and people have a right to feel very strongly about this. So why add, with all due respect, a media component to it where people oh, yeah. can take it and they can clip it and they can deep fake it, et cetera, et cetera. That's not going to help. That's going to further polarize other people. So I think what he's doing right now with meeting with small groups and keeping it behind closed doors and really listening, engaging, and sharing with people that this is, now that I know doesn't affect everyone, but we'll have to see. We'll see mm -hmm. where the conflict goes. And there might come another instance where he should address the public and address. And I think there was a time where I felt like he strongly should, but I don't think that is now this time. I think now we have to see where things go and, you know, hopefully this conflict comes to end very soon. And in the peaceful process, I think that's an opportunity where he can address this again. Okay, uh, gang, uh, we've got to leave it there. I want to thank you for covering a lot of ground with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to the Power Panel, uh, Brad Levine, Lisa Raitt, Vanda Nakata, and Rob Russo. Thanks so much, gang. Thanks, David.